Heidi Ho, it's Andrew. Today I would like to teach you how to use the factor theorem to find the zeros of this polynomial function. So first, what is the factor theorem? Well, here it is. The factor theorem states that the polynomial x minus k, which is basically represented as this in the problem, is a factor of a function f of x, which is represented as this, if and only if f of k is equal to zero. In other words, let me rephrase this, this thing is going to be a factor of this thing if and only if this factor divides nicely into this polynomial with a zero remainder, okay? That's what it's saying. Now, the way this is written, this is written kind of in, it's using the remainder theorem because the remainder theorem says that, you know, if you can identify your K value and you plug it in then for X and your function, and if that's zero, then you know your remainder is zero. But if you want more help with the remainder theorem, you know, check out a couple of videos prior uh, in this playlist. So uh, with that in hand, uh, what I'm going to do is I need to basically take this factor, divide it into this polynomial, and see what the remainder is, okay? The reason why I'm going to do it, though, with synthetic division, instead of using the remainder theorem, which, uh, because I'm assuming that the problem that they're giving us, all right, is going to work out nicely. Um, if it doesn't, though, work out nicely, uh, then we'd have to do a totally different method, all right, to find, uh, to find the zeros. Um, however, uh, this should divide evenly into this. So I'm going to use synthetic division. You could use the remainder theorem to kind of quickly do it and just check, but then you got to do synthetic division anyway because you're going to have to find the polynomial that's left after you take out this factor. That's a whole lot of talking. Let's get to working. Bam. So this is basically what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to take this polynomial function and divide into that polynomial function this polynomial. All right, and I want to see if when this is divides in, if it leaves a remainder of zero or not. So um, since this is a linear function, this is known as the divisor on the bottom. That's the dividend on the top. Um, since this divisor uh, is a linear function, basically, right? It's a linear type of polynomial. Uh, you don't have x squared or anything like that. Uh, you know, I, I can use my synthetic division table then to help me out. It goes a little faster. But if this was x squared, well, throw this thing in the garbage. It ain't going to work. All right. And then you have to do long division. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to use synthetic here. So uh, how do we know the number of columns we need in our synthetic division table, which is kind of like on the inside here of this L? You're going to look at your function on the top in the numerator, find the highest power, add one to it. And the total there, four, tells you the number of columns. So basically then inside the first column here, it's going to be the x cubed, the coefficient that is, the x squared, x, and then your constant. So the coefficient of your x cubed term is a one. Good. Coefficient of the x squared term is a three. Boom. Coefficient of the x term is a four. Boom. Constant term is a 12. Boom. Now, it, and you have to say boom after every time. All right. Otherwise, I'm going to take off points. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look at your divisor. And what you're going to do is you're going to set this bad boy equal to zero. So x plus three equals zero. Solve that for x. All right. And this method, all right, when this equals negative three, this value then is the value that gets plugged in right there. All right. Negative three. Now what you're going to do is you're going to follow this simple series of steps, or if you want to sound more intelligent, algorithm. So you're going to drop the one straight on down all the way to the bottom. That's why there's a red box there. You don't put anything in. Then you're going to take the one and multiply it by the outside value of negative three. You're going to put the result, which is negative three, in the next adjacent cell. Then you add this column. Okay. You add the columns. Zero. Then you're going to take zero and still multiply it by that outside value. That's why I kind of have the table looking like that. Uh, 0 times negative 3 is 0. Then you're going to plug it into the next cell, add that on up, which is a 4. Then you're going to take 4, multiply it by negative 3, and that's going to be a negative 12. Add this on up, and 0. The last value here in your synthetic division will always represent the remainder. So, the factor theorem says that if you take this polynomial, x minus k, I know it's a plus, but don't worry about that BS, and you divide it into this polynomial, if the remainder is zero, then you know that this is a factor, okay? Now, anytime you know a factor, you can always find the zero 
by setting that, and remember, zero just means the location, the value of x, where the function crosses the x-axis. You can always then set this factor equal to zero and solve it, all right, for x. But wait a minute, we kind of did that already, right? We already did that. So this is actually a zero. Okay, I'm going to move it on over here. Now, you know, don't just, don't, don't whatever, whatever this is, do, it doesn't mean it's a zero until you do this out, and this is a zero remainder, okay? Um, so you can't just say any, you know, you can't just write X plus, you know, two thirds or something like that. I don't know what that looks like. Seven thirds. I don't know what that is like three over three, maybe, but, uh, you can't just say that, oh yeah, let me just solve that for, you know, uh, X set it equal to zero. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be a, that's going to be one of the zeros of the function where the function crosses the X axis. No, that is not correct. All right. You first have to go through all of this and check to see if that the zero is the remainder. All right. Anyway, um, Let's get this, let's get this show on the road. So what this now tells you at the bottom, you have to remember that this is your constant term. This is going to be the coefficient of the X term. This is going to be the coefficient of your X squared term. It does not follow the same pattern as the top. If you notice, it's like one power less, so to speak. So when you do this division, then the answer is going to be one X squared or just X squared plus zero X, you know, but plus zero X, zero times anything is just zero. So don't even bother writing it. And then plus your constant four plus four. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is we still have to find two more zeros because since it's a cubic, we should expect that we have three zeros. Now, it might not cross the x-axis three times. You might have some imaginary zeros, basically. Um, but, you know, I want to now uh, find the remaining two. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just, I'm going to make this, instead of having a fraction over here, I'm going to cross multiply this value because you can look at this as like two fractions. I'm just going to cross multiply this value on, well, across. Just like that. And again, sound effects are necessary. Otherwise, you're going to lose points. So when I do this, right, I notice now that I have one factor here, but this is not factored. Okay, that's not in factored form. So what I can do, I could do this in a couple of ways now. I can say, oh, let me try to factor this. But the problem is it's not a perfect square. All right, it's not, you know, you're not, it, it's not going to be x plus 2, x minus 2, because that would have left you with a negative 4. Um, you know, the, the most surefire method here, and I know that this is a quadratic. The reason why is because I have an x squared term, right? All this is about pattern recognition. So once I realize I have a quadratic, I'm thinking to myself, well, how do I find the zeros of a quadratic? Oh my goodness, the formula x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over then 2a. Okay. Now, if you notice, this factor theorem kind of works out nicely if you have a cubic. Okay. Um, you know, if they gave you a factor and you had a cubic and you divide it, you're going to get a quadratic as the remainder. Well, no, I shouldn't say remainder. As the quotient. Okay. As the quotient. And then you can apply this formula and you can solve every single problem that way. But if this was a fourth power, then you'd be left with a cubic, and then it's like, oh, sh you know, it becomes a lot harder, all right? Um, which you might not want to use this method then because it might not help significantly in any case. What you can now do is you're going to identify in this formula the a, the b, and the c, all right? So remember, the a value is going to be the coefficient of the x squared term, so that's a 1. The b value is going to be the coefficient of the x term, but I don't have an x term, so it's a 0, and then your C is going to be the constant, which is a positive 4. So what you can do now, take this and plug it into that formula and just simplify it, do the math, okay? For brevity's sake, I'm not going to do that here because you're literally just plugging in the values and then just doing the algebra. I'm assuming now that that's pretty solid. Instead, though, what I'm going to show you is a quick program on the calculator that you're going to love. And if you don't have this program programmed, take a look at the link in the description below. I'm going to leave you, well, a link to a video that I made, it's like three or four minutes, and I'm walking through how to do this, and you're gonna love it because watch how fast this is. Ready? Hit enter, run the program. Then A is one, B is zero, C is four, and oh my goodness, I'm done. All right, I'm done. These are now two I and negative two I are going to be the additional zeros. And I told you that they're going to possibly be imaginary, which they are. So X is also gonna be two I, and X is also gonna be negative two I. Now, if they want just the real zeros, well, then you're only going to have one answer, all right? But if they want all the zeros, right, all the values, then you might have, including imaginary, then you might have three. 
Um, so what we should anticipate then, graphing this on a real axis, if you want, um, we should expect this only to cross the x-axis actually one time. So watch, let's plug it in. So let's do x cubed, x raised to the third, plus 3x squared, all right, plus 4x, and then plus 12. And then just hit graph. Now, it's a little hard to, I would have to, eh, let me zoom out a little bit. Let me zoom out. So let's hit three, enter. Yeah. So notice how it starts at the bottom. It comes all the way up. It makes a little dip, but then it keeps going. Okay, let me zoom back in. Um, so if you notice, though, it only crosses the x-axis one time then. And where does it cross? Negative one, negative two. Looks like around negative three. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> there it is, right? So, you know, you can also use the calculator not only to check yourself, but hopefully make this make a little bit more sense. Um, yeah, but that's all I got. That's all I got for you. So I really do appreciate it. Um, I really do hope this helps. If it does, if you wouldn't mind giving us a hand, tell some of your classmates about what we're trying to do. We got thousands of videos out there, not only in math, but physics and chemistry as well. We solve specific problems because that's what you're going to see on your test. And if it really helped you out, like and subscribe. It helps us out tremendously. And I really do appreciate it. We want to help more people. Take care.